Section 7.6 is about the rational zero theorem. This theorem is very useful to determine what factors there might be for a polynomial. Here you have a polynomial written out and we're told that the number p over q is a rational number and it's a zero. According to the theorem, the p, the top number, has to be a factor of the last term in the polynomial and the q, the bottom number, has to be a factor of the first term in the polynomial. You see an example here of 3 over 2 being a 0 and notice that 3 is a factor of 12 and 2 is a factor of 2. Now there's a corollary to this theorem which says that if the leading coefficient of 1 if the leading coefficient is 1, then any of those factors that you find, one of them must be uh, one of the zeros of the function. If the leading coefficient isn't 1, they don't have to be, but it's a good place to start. Now again, this is a, pr a pretty confusing idea until you see it written out as an example. So in this problem, we have to list all the possible zeros or all the possible solutions. Now we're going to use this idea of p over q. Now the p has to be a factor of the last term, in this case the 9. So what are the factors of 9? Well, they're 1 and negative 1, because you've got to use positive and negative. They're 3 and negative 3, and 1, or excuse me, 9 and negative 9. So there are six possible values that will multiply to give you 9. 1, 3, and 9, negative 1, negative 3, or negative 9. We can also list the factors of the leading coefficient, 2 positive and negative 1, positive and negative 2. Now from this we can find what p over q is and all of those numbers represent the possible zeros for this function. So let's do that. p over q, I could do 1 over 1 or 1. I could do 3 over 1, so positive and negative 3. I could do 9 over 1. I can do 1 over 2, which would be a positive and negative half. I could do 3 over 2, which would be a positive and negative 3 halves, and I could do a 9 over 2, which is positive and negative 9 halves. So these are all of the possible zeros of this function. Let's go over to this one. All my p's are going to be the factors of 105, so you just list all the factors of 105. Plus or minus 1, 3 goes into 105, so does 5, uh, 7 does. 15, 21, 35, and 105. Now it's probably going to take you a lot longer to come up with those rather than me just telling you. And now we find that Q is 1. So that's easy, plus and minus 1. So when that's the case, when your leading coefficient is 1, then your answer for all of the factors is actually the same as all of your P's, because you're going to put all of them over 1, and these are all the possible zeros of this function. Here we're trying to find the volume of a rectangular solid. And we're given the three sides x, x minus 4, and x plus 6, and told the volume is 675. So I'm going to multiply all three of my sides and set it equal to the volume. Now if I take these and, and distribute them out, I'm going to get a, a large polynomial. Now I've already set this polynomial equal to zero because this is the polynomial function, if you will. This is the polynomial that we want to solve and find out what x is. Now the nice thing about this problem is because we're dealing with lengths, we don't care about any of the negative uh, roots of this. We only want to deal with the positive ones. So using Descartes' rule of signs, I see a change in sign no, I see a change in sign here, so that's a yes, and I see a change in sign of a no here. So I know that there's only one real root that I should be looking for. So once I find it, I can stop working. The trouble is, how do I know what number to start with? I could start at 1, but if the solution isn't up until 300, uh, that's going to take a lot of, uh, of trying numbers. So I'm going to use the rational zero theorem to give me some values to start with. So I want to find some potential factors of this polynomial. I know that I'm going to look at the value of p, and that's going to come from the factors of 675. So here you see listed all the factors of 675. I'm going to put the negatives on there too, even though we don't need to include the negatives. 
because the leading coefficient is 1, we know that all of those represent uh, my possible zeros of this polynomial equation. I'm going to set up my synthetic substitution by using the coefficients there of 1, 2, negative 24, and negative 675. I'm going, to, I'm going to make a table. So I'm going to try the number 1. And remember, you, you add, so 1 plus nothing is 1. And then you multiply 1 times 1 and add it to the 2. Then you multiply 1 times 3 and add it to the negative 24. And then 1 times negative 21 and add that to negative 675. So this table represents my synthetic substitution. I'm not actually doing it completely full hand. I'm kind of doing it in a shortcut version here. So this table represents uh, me plugging in 1 and 3, then 5, then 9, and I eventually got here by seeing that the remainder when I plug 9 in was 0. So I know the sides of my rectangular solid are 9 centimeters. 9 minus 4 is 5 centimeters. 9 plus 6 is 15 centimeters. Here's our last example, and if you didn't get the, if you didn't understand the, the example that I just did with the rectangular solid, um, then this one hopefully will be better for you because I'm not going to skip anything. I'm going to do every single step and try to show you as much of it as I possibly can. We want to find the zeros of this big polynomial. And we know because it has a fourth degree that we're going to look for four roots. But using Descartes' rule of signs is going to help us figure out how many of them are going to be positive and how many of those are going to be negative and if there's going to be any imaginary. So here you see my two functions with x and the negative x. Using Descartes' rule of signs, I found out that there are four changes of signs, which means they're either going to be four, two, or zero real roots that are positive. And there's no changes of signs when I use the negative x, so there's going to be no real roots that are negative. Now to give us a place to start by searching out some of those roots, I'm going to use the rational zero theorem. So my p is going to be factors of 60, so I'm going to list those. Then I'm going to list the q's, which are all factors of 2, so 1 and 2. And now I'm going to list the p over q's, which represent the fractions. Well, it, it's kind of nice because all of these numbers, if you put them over 1, are included. So we have to include all of the factors of p, but we also have to include all of those factors divided by 2 which means we have to include plus or minus one half. That's a potential root. Two over two is a one, which is already on my list. Uh, three over two is one I have to put. Four over two is a two, which is already on my list. Five over two is not, so I have to add that. Six over two is a three, which is there. 10 over two is a five. 12 over two is a six. 15 over two has to be added and the rest of them are even. When you divide them by 2, you get one that's already on the list. So all of my potential roots come from this list and this list. Those are all the potential numbers that are going to be roots. So I'm going to start with the number 1 and then just work my way up until I find one of my solutions that's a real root. Again, I'm going to go to this separate slide and do all the synthetic substitution for you. And I'm going to use these values, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I'm just going to keep going until I find one that has a remainder of 0. So here's the work with synthetic substitution, and I found out eventually that 5 is one of my solutions. And I also found out that these coefficients make up my new depressed polynomial of 2x cubed minus 3x squared plus 8x minus 12. So I'm going to go back. So now I know that one of my solutions is x equals 5. And I'm going to take that new polynomial that I had, 2x cubed minus 3x squared plus 8x minus 12. I'm going to set that equal to 0 and see if I can solve it um, using another method, you know, an easier way, and I see four terms, so that tells me that maybe I should try to group. So I'm going to do that. Take out an x squared, leaving me with a 2x minus 3. Here I'm going to take out a 4, which leaves a 2x minus 3. 
which is very promising because then I have 2x minus 3 times x squared plus 4. And that equals 0. And now I should be able to set those equal to 0 and solve. So this is x equals 3 halves. So that's another one of my solutions. And then over here, I'm going to get x squared equals negative 4, which I could take the square root of. And that means that x is going to equal plus or minus. I'm going to take an i out. And the square root of 4 is 2, so positive or negative 2i. So it ends up that these are my four solutions. And two of them are real, which is what I knew I was going to have, either 4, 2, or 0. And two of them are imaginary.